heart disease still kills more people than all cancer combined. And fundamentally, you may wonder, why is that so? Why is it that when somebody's heart loses ability to pump blood, there is nothing we can do? To really understand this problem, we must first understand what part of the heart is responsible for the pumping function. In the heart muscle, there are specialized beating heart cells. They're called cardiomyocytes. They have a unique ability to contract. And when they contract in concert, the heart beats and pushes the blood forward. These cells sit in a jello-like matrix and they're surrounded by other non-beating cells. Heart muscle is also fed by a very high density of blood vessels. When these beating heart cells die, or when they stop contracting as a result of disease, the beating function of the heart is lost. So this stimulates a very obvious idea to replace or restore somebody's beating heart function. We must restore these beating heart cells. But where are they gonna come from? When I was a graduate student, the scientific dogma at that time was that we are born with a certain number of beating heart cells and we die with exactly the same number of cells or we could just lose them due to diseases such as hypertension or injury such as myocardial infarction. But thanks to the nuclear probes of the 40s and 50s, we now know that heart cells have very slight ability to turn over. You're probably shocked right now. You're thinking, what do nuclear probes have in common with heart disease? During these nuclear probes, carbon-14 was released into the atmosphere. And regardless of the fact that they were conducted at very remote islands in the Pacific, due to the wind currents and mixing in the atmosphere, carbon-14 would spread around the world in about two years. Uh, this uh, means that people who were born around this time were essentially exposed to a spike of carbon-14. This uh, fact enabled the scientists in Sweden to sample hearts of uh, patients. They would take a small biopsy of heart tissue, isolate beating heart cells from this heart tissue, and subject them to carbon dating. From these experiments, they learned that heart cells do indeed have ability to turn over at about a rate of 0.1 to uh, 0.5 to 1 percent per year. What does this mean in practical terms? It means that for a person who is about 80 years old, about half of the cells in their hearts are those that they were born with, and the other half are cells that were created during their lifetime. This is very different compared to rapidly dividing cells in some of our other organs. For example, the lining of the gut turns over every three days. The surface of our skin turns over about once a month. This also means that even if you are willing to volunteer and undergo cardiac biopsy to donate your cells to science or to try to save somebody who has heart disease, we would simply not be able to make more beating heart cells in a reasonable period of time. These fundamental limitations leaves the doctors with no regenerative therapies. They don't have the right cells to put back. The only thing they can do is use drugs that temporarily restore uh, the beating heart function. This same limitation is also a big problem for pharmaceutical companies they don't have beating heart tissue to test the drugs on. So what they use now are animal cells, such as Chinese hamster ovary cells. Those are very far removed from human beating heart cells. And then they take human proteins and put them into these animal cells. Then they apply a potential drug onto these transformed cells. And they try to find out is the drug safe for human proteins? If it's safe, then they move to animals, such as mice or rats. Occasionally, they would use rabbits or monkeys. And after that, a drug goes into a human. And despite their best efforts of these really responsible scientists in the pharma companies, they're only about 75 to 90% sure a drug is safe before it is given to a human for a first time. 
This also means that very many promising drugs are abandoned early on in the development, and some dangerous drugs actually reach the human use. An example of such a dangerous drug is Vioxx. It killed about 27,000 people in the United States alone, and it cost Merck about $5 billion in civil and crim criminal settlements. I'm willing to argue that if you are one of the people who lost a loved one due to a, a drug toxicity such as this one, there is no amount of money that can replace this loss. And it is for those reasons that the mission of the work in my lab is to create a living, beating human heart tissue that we can use for drug testing or to uh, repair somebody's injured heart. And in this work, uh, I'm supported by a group of about 15 really brilliant young scientists at the University of Toronto. They're very energetic, very smart people who really keep me going when the obstacles uh, seem too high. So I'll tell you right now our secret recipe, how to make a beating heart tissue. What do you need? So essentially, you need uh, two things. You need uh, cells that can divide at a reasonably high rate and that can give rise to beating heart cells. And then you need to trick them into thinking that they're in a real adult human heart. But I just told you that we cannot take cells from our hearts and make more beating heart cells. So how are we gonna do this? In uh, 2006, a Japanese scientist, uh, Shinya Yamanaka, reported on a landmark discovery. He found that it is possible to take cells from the skin and uh, put into them four biological factors. These factors then reprogram the cells. Skin cells forget what they are, and they go back into the stem cell state. The official scientific name for these cells is induced pluripotent stem cells. From these cells, then, it is possible to make any other cell type of the human body. This also means that we can get pluripotent stem cells from adults with informed consent without any ethical limitations. And this is really the first time in history that we are able to do this. In our lab, we use uh, human-induced pluripotent stem cells, and then we apply a cocktail of proteins, growth factors, to these cells in a very precise time intervals. These growth factors turn the cells into small, primitive, immature, beating heart cells. Yes, they can beat, but they don't beat like cells in your heart or in my heart. So what do we do next? The next step is apply our engineering expertise. We use techniques from electronics industry to create mini cultivation vessels that have very precisely controlled geometry and topography. And into these mini culture vessels, we apply cells using a jello-like matrix that they really love. And finally, there comes the last ingredient of our uh, recipe, and that's electrical stimulation. We essentially zap the cells with pulses of electricity to make them beat in synchrony and to connect to one another to make a truly adult human heart tissue. Why do we use electrical stimulation? Where does this motivation come from? First of all, our hearts beat in response to electrical impulses. The heart is the first organ that starts functioning during development. At about three weeks of gestation, it starts beating as a result of electrical stimuli. And this is in many cases before the expecting mother even knows that she's expecting. The heart is also the last organ that functions. Life ends when the heart stops beating. These first beats are slow and irregular, but the beating rate that then keeps increasing during the development and it peaks about seven weeks gestation, and after that, it keeps going down. So that's exactly what we do in the lab, but in a period of four weeks. We make the cells beat faster and faster. As they beat faster and faster, they work harder and harder. As they work harder, they become stronger. They're bigger, they connect to one another. They become like cells in adult hearts. What we've done in the lab, we essentially created a boot camp for heart cells. At the end of this process, we get a tissue. This is a strip of tissue that beats just like uh, uh, tissue in the adult heart. And not only that, but it also responds to drugs in a similar way that a human heart would respond to. 
It is for those reasons that a few pharma companies approached my lab and asked to validate this human heart tissue in their drug discovery efforts. And to facilitate this work, in 2014, with uh, colleagues from Columbia University, we started a company called Tata Biosystems that now works with about half a dozen of pharma companies, major pharma companies, in uh, drug testing and validation protocols. So we are starting to slowly impact the drug development process. But what is next? There is really a tremendous variability of humans around the globe. We are all human, but we are all different. And it is these fine differences that make a huge functional difference. So can we actually find drugs that work for you, for you specifically? And so as I said before, we can take cells from your skin or even cells from your blood and make stem cells out of them. This means that we can harvest blood cells or skin cells from a patient and make their own personalized heart tissue in the lab. Using this personalized heart tissue, we can find out what exactly causes the disease in that patient and we can optimize the drug application protocol for that person. And it is on these personalized medicine projects that I work with colleagues from Toronto General Hospital and Medical College of Wisconsin. I also said that the heart muscle is fed by an extremely high density of blood vessels. And it is through these blood vessels that drugs are distributed through your body or my body. Our current heart tissue that we use for drug testing does not have blood vessels, and we are working really hard to create branching vasculature in each of them. To do this, we came up with a new 3D stamping technique. And if you think about 3D printing as building a material dot by dot, then 3D stamping is building the material sheet by sheet. Finally, you may ask me, well, when am I going to have a new heart? Okay, enough with drug testing, personalized medicine. I want a new heart for me or for somebody in my family. I want that heart patch and I want it placed in my body. I can tell you that through a series of painstaking experiments that are taking place all around the world from Paris to Toronto to Seattle, scientists are really starting to understand what exactly happens to these stem cell derived heart cells when they're placed in real working hearts. And they're using animal models and small scale clinical studies to find this out. Towards this goal, my lab is using biomaterials and these same 3D stamping techniques to create human heart tissues that are fully functional, but they're also injectable. This means that in the future, we will be able to deliver this heart tissue into your heart without having to open your chest fully, just using a small keyhole on the side of your chest. Finally, in closing, I would like to say that in, for every three healthy Canadians, there are two who have a chronic disease or a condition that is waiting to be cured. We are all affected in some way, either as patients or as people who lost loved ones. And I personally lost my father to cancer and my grandparents to heart disease. We are, the future is almost here for cardiac drug testing. We are already using a tissue built from human stem cells in the lab and brought to life with zaps of electricity to find new drugs. The uh, potential advantages and benefits of this approach are truly unlimited. We will be able to create personalized heart tissue for you and really figure out what causes the disease. Once we extend the engineered tissues to other organs, we will be able to find uh, cures for those diseases as well. Ultimately, these engineered tissues built in the lab will give us better health and a longer life. Thank you very much.